is. Where there is hate, may we so love. Where there is hurt, may we forgive. Where there is strife, may we make one. Where all is doubt, may we so faith. Where all is gloom, may we so hope. Where all is night, may we so light. Where all is tears, may we so joy. Jesus, our Lord, may we not seek to be consoled as to console, nor look to understanding hearts, but look for hearts to understand. May we not look for love's return, but seek to love unselfishly, for in our giving we receive, and in forgiving are forgiven. Dying we live and are reborn, through death's dark night to endless day. Lord, make us servants of your peace, to wake at last in heaven's light. Hello, welcome to St. James's online worship for Sunday, July 12th, which is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. I hope you will feel warmly welcomed and empowered by the liturgy you're about to join. Uh, if you'd like to uh, follow along the service and have the words to participate, uh, you can find the worship bulletin on the church's website, which is www.stjamescambridge.org. Blessed be God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. 
Jacob was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Well, Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use of is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in saying the psalm. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and I am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. A reading from the book of Romans. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Hear what the spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. 
Glory to you, O Christ. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd st stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, another case sixty, and another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Listen, says Jesus. Let anyone with ears listen. I was amused this week at a somewhat unexpected email I received. So at least for a little bit, uh, we're trying out this new newsletter column called What Can I Do? We're asking folks from the church to share how they're using their time during these days of racism and pandemic and sheltering. Uh, most folks shared activities they were doing, like protesting or reading. That's the sort of thing I was expecting. So I was caught off guard pleasantly when I read Laura Warren's email that we shared in the newsletter on Thursday. Laura began writing this. More than anything else, I have been pausing regularly to notice my own reactivity during this overwhelming time, listening internally to discern skillful action before speaking or acting in day-to-day -day interactions. Now, on some level, it's not surprising uh, that the therapist, uh, you know, leads with the inner work. Um, but it's something that I actually needed to hear. Because I'm always someone who can fall in the trap of not listening all that well. I can get wrapped up in the to-do list in my mind or just move too fast because I, th I feel like I have to do too much. Or just not be fully attentive to the moment I'm in. Some of what I think Jesus is hinting at in today's gospel is precisely this, listening. He speaks of these four soils, and most are too hard or too thorny to take in the seed and allow for growth, but the good soil brings forth grain. So, our inward soil management is crucial. And part of that is careful listening and cultivating in ourselves the capacity to listen and to be receptive. With God's Spirit, we can gradually refocus and reshape ourselves through attention and perseverance so we can better hear what God is saying and better receive what God is giving. We are called to inward soil management. But also, we're called to outward soil management in the world. A, a little bit of an aside. Um, uh, when Jesus uses the, this imagery of sowing, um, it was familiar to the agrarian peoples of his day, but it was also evocative of earlier Jewish prophetic use of this sort of language. Jesus wasn't making something up here out of his own sort of creativity, um, as he often did. Um, but also, like he often did, he's drawing on his, himself 
or rather he's drawing on his sort of lineage uh, as a Jewish prophet. Hosea, for example, some seven centuries earlier, proclaimed this. Ephraim was a trained heifer that loved to thresh, and I spared her fair neck. But I will make Ephraim break the ground. Judah must plow. Jacob must break up the ground. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Sowing righteousness. Sowing justice. This is the outward soil management. Now, sometimes we in the church have sort of misunderstood Jesus' words that seem to focus on the inner life as a sign that he really wasn't interested with the wider world, with justice, with social transformation, that sort of thing. Um, but not only does this ignore the places in the scriptures where Jesus explicitly talks about such things, but it also ignores the fact that often what Jesus was doing was calling attention to the inner dimensions that were less articulated early in the, in the tradition, because the tradition was already so clear that justice, that making the world a better place, that that was the way of God. Outward and inward soil management are both equally important parts of our collective callings as Christians, as followers of Jesus. These days, of course, I think the most obvious outward soil management we need to be about is responding to racism and white supremacy. It is the toxicity that has poisoned our country since its inception. It creates brutality and violence. It creates inequity and injustice. It creates fear and anger. It ruins the lives of brown and black people, obviously, but is also hurt hurtful to most white folks. But the earth that is poisoned by racism, that too is a soil that can be managed, a soil that can be healed can be improved. Like many folks these days, I'm making my way through Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, and I was intrigued to see that he doesn't care for terms like institutional racism or systemic racism, the sort of words that I use frequently. He prefers the turn of phrase racist policies. And the reason for this is Words like systemic can feel really sort of amorphous and hard to understand and therefore hard to respond to. But a policy is something more concrete, something that can be changed. For instance, a policy that allows white police officers to face no or few consequences for brutality against blacks. That can be changed, so there are consequences and there will be less violence. You know, I, it can be easy these days to feel paralyzed. There is so much that is wrong. There is so much that is sick. There is so much that is broken. There is so much wrong that also seems utterly unchangeable. Um, but what, what Kendi reminds us of is that um, while there may be a lot, if we just do a little thing, find one concrete thing to work on, and we all do our little thing because there's a lot of us, then the soil of our country, just like the soil of our hearts, can be managed. One more thing. Um, I think it's worth also pointing out that uh, what also gives us hope, or what more truly gives hope um, for us the followers of Jesus, is that in the end, it's not about us doing it, it's about God doing it. The parable of the sower, on some level, isn't about soil, it's about seeds. The sower doesn't seem to till the soil at all. The sower just casts seeds wantonly, wildly, all over the place, all the time. And yes, many of those seeds don't take root. Maybe even, maybe even the vast majority of them. But they keep getting tossed by that sower. And those that do find the good soil, they flourish. They explode with growth. As the text said, other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, says the scripture. If only one out of four seeds makes it, but that one seed produces a hundredfold, then God's way of love and God's way of justice does still come out way ahead. 
Mystic Thomas Merton once wrote about uh, these sorts of texts. He said, Every moment and every event of every person's life on earth plants something in their soul. For just as the wind carries thousands of winged seeds, so each moment brings with it germs of spiritual vitality that come to rest imperceptibly in the minds and wills of humankind. Uh, obviously, Merton here is focusing more on the inner sort of stuff. Uh, but I love that his language is, uh, is about a God that has placed us in a world, a world rather, that's constantly germinating and re-germinating from new seeds. We usually don't see those seeds, but regardless of how good a listener we are. But we don't live in a world that is fundamentally one of stagnancy and of decay and of death. That's not the world God gave us. No, God placed us in a vibrant and exciting world, a world of constant change, a world of constant growth, and a world that is nurtured by these seeds of justice and seeds of relationship and seeds of love. God unleashes those everywhere. That's our hope. And now I invite you to join me in proclaiming the faith of the Church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, of light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Prayers of the People Dear people of God, During these days and throughout the whole history of our country, the forces of racism have attacked human dignity, denied rights, undergirded the system of oppression and in it inequity and took the lives of brown and black people. For Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Armand Arbery, Dominique Fells, Rhea Milton, and all who have died in this country from the violence that comes of its racism, we pray to you, God of mercy. May you lead all your people to hear and join the voices of brown and black people among us and build that beloved community where there is that true peace that only comes hand in hand with justice and equity. We pray to you, God of righteousness. For all who are in a place of outrage, fear, and grief at this time, we pray to you, God of comfort.
guide all your followers who have privilege born of injustice and inequity to acknowledge that and to be open to changes and sacrifices that might lessen the oppression and suffering of others. We pray to you, God of truth. Dear people of God, human life is also disturbed, disrupted, and threatened at this time by the novel coronavirus. For all who have suffered directly and indirectly during this global pandemic, may you sustain, console, and heal them. We pray to you, God of mercy. For all good efforts to rescue life and to maintain people's health, may you strengthen, guide, and protect all who have committed to fight against this disease. We pray to you, God of grace. May you lead us to combat racism, discrimination, stigmatization, and xenophobia with courage in the midst of this health crisis. We pray to you, God of righteousness. For an early end to the transmission of COVID-19, that is harming all and for life, health and peace for all through your mercy, grace and loving care and through human solidarity, integrity and mutual support. We pray to you, God of love, I invite your prayers and thanksgivings at this time. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. Seek after justice and the blessing of God who made us, who loves us, and who travels with us be with you now and forever. Amen. 
We go forth rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Alleluia. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thine ancient church story, bring her born to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour, lo, the hosts of evil around us scorn thy Christ, assail his ways. From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage. For the living of these days, for the living of these days, cure thy children's warring madness, bend our pride to thy control, shame our wanton selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul, grant us wisdom. Grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's call, lest we miss thy kingdom's call. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the gift of thy salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore, serving